Yeah, well, I have two books coming out this fall. One is a collection of letters that a woman wrote. She was a teacher for freed people during and after the Civil War. So she spent 1863 and 64 on the Sea Isles of South Carolina. She was in Norfolk, Virginia from 69 to 70 or 68 to 70. And then she was in Raleigh, North Carolina after that. And so she gives a really incredible picture of the Civil War South and then the post-war South in different areas. And then I also have a collection of about 125 letters from African-Americans to Lincoln. That'll be published by UNC Press in October. The first one will be published by UVA Press around October. And then I've written a history of black visitors to the Lincoln White House. I have not yet signed a contract on that one. So it'll probably come out in 2022. All right. So anytime you want to start. Sure. OK. It's all yours. Thanks. Thank you all for having me here tonight. It's nice to see some familiar faces. Um, Bill Miller is probably right down the road from me here in, in Yorktown or Williamsburg and John Willen and some others from the Lincoln Forum. It's good to see you all. I'm going to share a PowerPoint. Let's see. All right. And I'm going to talk about the election of 1864 today. And uh, a lot of this is based on a book that I published in 2014 called Emancipation, the Union Army and the Re-Election of Abraham Lincoln. I first became interested in the election of 1864 when I was actually an undergraduate. In 2000, it was the first year I was old enough to vote in a presidential election. So I voted that year. And I also then was talking to Mark Neely, who is a Pulitzer Prize winning historian at Penn State. And I asked him if I could do an independent study with him. And the topic we came up with together was the soldier vote of 1864. As I'll talk about in a little bit, the, elect the Civil War was the first time where there was a massive amount of absentee voting in American history, mail-in voting, what we would call today. And uh, no one had ever really studied that. The last book, the only book on the subject prior to mine had been published in 1915 by a Union veteran. And so it was a really wonderful topic. And then it took me about a decade and a half to finally turn into a book. Um, but that's what I'll be talking about tonight. Before I get to, there we go. Before I get to the election itself, I wanted to say something about how different elections were in the 19th century than how they are today. And part of what you can, part of the way to understand that difference is by looking at ballots. And so I've put four ballots here. Each of these is for Abraham Lincoln. And if you look at them, you see they're all different. And in fact, the one at the right, you'll notice is in German. They all have different symbols. They all have, some of them have flags, some of them have eagles, they're different colors. And what you can see is that there's really no standardization in how the ballots were done. And the reason for that was, was that in the 19th century, the government didn't print the ballots. The political parties did. One of my pet peeves is that people always say, in 1860, Abraham Lincoln wasn't on the ballot in the South. And the reality is he wasn't on the ballot in the South because there was no ballot official ballot in the South, the parties printed their own, and there was really no Republican Party in the South to print Lincoln ballots. And so it's not that Lincoln wasn't on the ballot in 1860 in the South, it's just that there were no Lincoln ballots in the South. Um, and the way you would do it in those days is when you went to vote, you would go to the election scene, to the polling place, and you would find the operatives from your political party. So if you're a Republican, you're gonna find the Republic, Republican operatives. If you're a Democrat, you're gonna find the Democrats and they will then give you one of these ballots and you will then go cast it. And one of the key things that we have to understand to understand civil war politics is that there was no secrecy in this process. From the moment you go to the poll, you're going to a party operative. So everyone sees the ballot that you're taking. And then you're gonna carry a ballot like one of these and it might be a distinctive color. It could be pink or yellow or blue. It's gonna have symbols on it. It's gonna have the name emblazoned large. You can see Abraham Lincoln is large on two of these four ballots. And then you make your way through the crowd to go vote. And when you go vote, you actually then deposit your ticket into a glass bowl. 
in most elections in this era, the ballot boxes are actually like fish bowls. And so from the moment you get your ballot until you vote, there's no secrecy. And that's a really important thing for understanding the politics of the 19th century, the pressure and the intimidation and the violence that often took place around American elections, especially in big cities like Baltimore or New York, had to do in part with the fact that there's no secret voting. We don't get what's called the Australian ballot or the secret ballot until later in the 19th century. And I'll put up one other image of ballots. This about eight years ago, a, an auction sold 260 some ballots from the presidential election. And this is the, the stockpile that sold in the auction. So you can see there's a pink McClellan one and then there's a blue ballot behind it and then ones with different symbols and colors throughout. This hall of ballots sold for $8,000 in 2013. Now I'm gonna go back to early in 1864 I actually, in 2017, I think it was, I published a history of dreams during the Civil War called Midnight in America. One of the images that I looked at in that book was this one here. It shows Abraham Lincoln asleep in early 1864. This was printed by New York Illustrated News in March. And you can see his big shoes that need to be filled. And in the foreground of this image, as Lincoln is sleeping in the background are a bunch of Republican operatives, people like Horace Greeley and Anna Dickinson and um, Charles Sumner and William Seward and all these figures who were dissatisfied with Lincoln and they wanted to replace him. And the, so while he's asleep, they're trying to figure out who is it? Who is it that we can pick that will fill his shoes? Ultimately, the Republicans settled on Lincoln though. And in June of 1864, they held their national convention and they put him on the ticket for reelection as president. They dumped his vice presidential candidate or his, his current vice president who was Hannibal Hamlin of Maine. He was seen as more radical and they wanted to try to have a broad appeal. And so they got rid of Hannibal Hamlin and in his place, they put on Andrew Johnson who was the military governor of Tennessee. Johnson was a Southerner. He was the only Southerner to stay in the U.S. Senate during uh, the secession crisis and during the war. And then he became military governor of Tennessee. And so what the Republicans hoped was we can keep Lincoln on the ticket. We bring in a war Democrat, someone from the South, and that will give a broad appeal and it will hopefully help us win the election. The other thing that the Republicans did that was very important in this election was they renamed themselves. They did a new branding campaign. And in this election, instead of calling themselves the Republican party, they called themselves the union ticket. And so this takes place in June of 1864. Now, as all of you know, the summer of 1864 was a very bloody period of the war with the Overland camp campaign. Grant is trying to push through Virginia to capture Richmond. He's going uh, south from Fredericksburg, ultimately winds up stuck outside of Petersburg and then in a long siege. And this is a terribly bloody time. In the Overland Campaign, the Union Army loses some 50 to 60,000 um, soldiers as they're making these moves through May and June of 64 down from Fredericksburg, ultimately to Petersburg. And this is an image um, I believe it's from Cold Harbor that shows one of the burial details. It might be wilderness, but it shows one of the burial details after the battle. Uh, the corpses and these skeletons from um, the year before. And as this fighting is going on, the people of the North are becoming very weary of the war. And Lincoln actually becomes convinced throughout the summer of 1864 that he's going to lose reelection as the, the fighting drags on and Sherman is stuck outside of Atlanta and Grant can't seem to capture Petersburg and then Richmond, the people of the North are beginning to want a change. And I wanna show you a couple of cartoons from the era that I think are helpful to see because we often think of Abraham Lincoln as this giant statue in Washington DC at the Lincoln Memorial. And we, all, we often forget how unpopular he became at various points of the war. And so this is a cartoon that shows him as a dunce and he's trampling on the constitution. And you can see the dead corpse in the background. 
Here's another one that shows him as a tyrant. He has a dagger of Yankee liberty and the goddess Columbia is trying to restrain him from all of the destruction that he's causing. Here's another one that shows Lincoln rising as a phoenix out of the ashes of things that are most dear to Americans, the US Constitution, states rights, public credit, habeas corpus, uh, commerce. Lincoln is seen as destroying these things to raise his own power. And then this is one other that captures the sense of Lincoln's ineptitude as there's all this suffering and death. And so this one's called Columbia Demands Her Children. And you see the goddess Columbia or Liberty saying, Mr. Lincoln, give me back my 500,000 sons. And Lincoln just responds as he was famous for doing, he's, he's kind of changing the subject and says, well, this reminds me of the story. And these cartoons, I think, are helpful for giving us a sense that, you know, the re-election of Abraham Lincoln in 1864 was not inevitable. And throughout that summer, Lincoln himself became convinced that he would lose. And in fact, on August 23rd, 1864, Lincoln wrote out something that's now known as the Blind Memorandum. And this is the original copy of it that uh, is held at the Library of Congress. And it was scanned by the papers of Abraham Lincoln and the staff at the Library of Congress. And I'll read it for you here. He wrote this, this morning as for some days past, it seems exceedingly probable that this administration will not be reelected. Then it will be my duty to so cooperate with the president elect as to save the union between the election and the inauguration as he will have secured his election on such ground that he cannot possibly save it afterwards. And so here is Lincoln convinced that he's going to lose the election. And there's a long period in that time uh, between the election and the inauguration. Now it's until January 20th. Then the inauguration wasn't until March 4th. And Lincoln didn't yet know for sure who the Democratic nominee would be because the Democrats hadn't hadn't yet had their convention, but he was pretty sure it was going to be McClellan, George McClellan, and he was pretty sure that McClellan would not be able to save the Union. And so Lincoln was pledging himself to work with McClellan to do that before he was out of office and the Democrats gained control of the government. And Lincoln took this document and he sealed it up and he took it to his cabinet and he had each of them sign it and they didn't know what they were signing hence the blind memorandum but he was essentially getting them to commit to work with him to uh, save the union before they were out of office around this time on august 19th lincoln also had a really interesting meeting with the abolitionist frederick douglas frederick douglas and lincoln had met once before in august of 1863 and Lincoln called Douglas to come meet with him again on August 19th, 1864. And when Douglas came to the White House, Lincoln said to him, the slaves are not running away as, as quickly as we would like. And he said to Douglas, we need to come up with a way to spread the news of the Emancipation Proclamation as far and as wide as we can so that slaves flee to union lines and flee to the free states before I'm out of office next March because once I'm out of office, the, you know, the next president is going to repeal the Emancipation Proclamation. And so Douglas and Lincoln came up with a plan that they sort of modeled after John Brown in 1859. Douglas called it a band of scouts. And the plan was to try to send scouts into the South and get them to tell the slaves to run away now. And this is a really important moment that I don't think is fully appreciated today, because most people say, well, Lincoln only freed the slaves out of military necessity. But what this moment with Frederick Douglass uh, shows us is that Lincoln was not simply freeing the slaves because it was a military necessity. Freeing the slaves in this way at this point in the war had nothing to do with winning. It had everything to do with making freedom as broad and as permanent as possible. And Frederick Douglass walked away from that meeting with a new appreciation for Lincoln. Well, the Democrats 
supposed to have their national convention in the beginning of the summer of 1864, but they saw how badly things were going. And so they decided to put it off as long as they could so that they could still have enough time to campaign. And so they held their convention at the end of August, 1864. And this is an image of them going into the convention. You can see the banners and the flags, a lot of excitement. Again, they're feeling pretty confident that they're gonna be able to win. And uh, the place where they held the convention was known as the Wigwam. And just for clarification, it's not the same Wigwam that Lincoln was nominated in Chicago in 1860. Well, this is an image of the interior of the, of the Wigwam where the Democrats held their convention. Again, you get a sense of the excitement, but there was a lot of division among the Democrats. Some Democrats were in favor of the war. They wanted to fight for reunion, but they didn't support a lot of Lincoln's more controversial policies like emancipation or conscription or suspending the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus. Other Democrats were peace Democrats and they wanted an end of the war. They wanted an armistice with the South uh, to try to negotiate a peace. Some of them wanted to try to negotiate to reunify the nation. Others wanted to try to negotiate to let the South go. And so despite the excitement that you see depicted in this cartoon, there's a lot of division at stake here. And ultimately the Democrats put forward a very divided ticket and platform. They nominate for president George B. McClellan, and that came as no surprise to most Americans in 1864. McClellan was pro-war, but he was also essentially pro-slavery. He was going to repeal the Emancipation Proclamation if he got into office. But to try to balance the pro-war McClellan, they nominate a peace Democrat or Copperhead from Ohio named George Pendleton. And then the Democrats made a very fateful decision they put in their platform a plank that called the war a failure. They said after four years of failure to restore the union by war, that they needed to try something new and they wanted an armistice to uh, negotiate with the South. Now, in August of 1864, that actually didn't seem like a terrible thing to most Democrats or even maybe to a lot of Americans because the war was going so badly. But in early September, 1864, General Sherman finally captures Atlanta. And that causes Northern hopes to skyrocket. And now calling the war a failure looks like a very bad decision. And from that point forward, and then especially after the fall of Mobile Bay and uh, Union advances in the Shenandoah Valley in October, it becomes very clear that Lincoln will win election. Now I showed you at the beginning all those wire pullers look, looking at Lincoln's shoes. And uh, those were mostly radicals in the Republican party. And in fact, there was a radical candidate, John C. Fremont, who was in the race throughout the summer. He was nominated by what was sometimes called the radical democracy in May of 1864 at a convention in Cleveland. And a lot of Republicans were worried that he would split the Republican vote and cause the Democrats to win. And so they negotiated with him after the Democratic convention. And in early September of 1864, they persuaded Fremont to pull out of the race. And in exchange for that, Lincoln got rid of one of the conservatives in his cabinet, Montgomery Blair, the postmaster general. And so uh, Fremont pulling out of the race is something that also really makes it clear that Lincoln will win re-election. Now I wanna show you some images from the election. Uh, some of these are gonna be political cartoons and then some of these are gonna be artistic renderings to show you uh, what the election looked like and hopefully make it sort of come alive for you in, in a way. This is actually an image from 1862 that shows the popularity of George McClellan among the soldiers. But the problem that, that, that soldiers would have is that McClellan was now tied to a copperhead. And so this is a political cartoon from 1864. You can see that McClellan is a Siamese twin with George Pendleton and they're tied together by the party tie. And McClellan has his face towards the soldiers and he's trying to convince them that he's for them. And Pendleton is looking to Democrats. He's looking to Clement Vallandigham of Ohio and the governor of New York, Horatio Seymour to his side. And, and the difficulty that the Democrats have is how do you appeal to two totally different uh, mindsets, two totally different wings of the party? Um, that was gonna be the difficult aspect for them. And the Republicans 
are going to really try to capitalize on this and they're going to pit, uh, pitch McClellan as a traitor. And so here's an image from 1864. It's a Republican image showing the Democrats as compromising with the South. And it's dedicated, you can see at the bottom, dedicated to the Chicago Convention. And you can see a Union soldier who's been wounded. He's lost his leg and he's bowing to Jefferson Davis over the grave that says in the memory of Union heroes in a useless war. In other words, if you elect the Democrats, this is all gonna be for nothing. Here's another image that shows a two-faced McClellan on a broken platform being held up by copperheads and Jeff Davis and the devil. And is he pro-war or is he pro-peace? That division between the peace and the war wings of the Democrats is something the Republicans really exploited. And so here you have the Chicago platform and it's got shattered windows being pulled by a very sickly donkey. And of course the donkey is a, an image that goes back for the Democratic Party to at least the 1830s. So the, again, the Republicans are making hay out of that. Treason was a big theme. The Democrats are gonna be uh, pitched as traitors. Here's McClellan being ridden on by a devil as he's again bowing to Jeff Davis with a, a, pit, a pick in his hand to signify 1862. Again, this theme of treason and devils, uh, devils are leading McClellan. You've got Democratic newspapers drawing his, um, his carriage forward. I won't spend too much time on all these devils, but I'll just sort of show you some of these images and you get the point. This is a great one though, because it's the Republicans or the union plank here saying, what do you want? If you're cro crossing the abyss of war, do you wanna walk across a plank that's firm in one piece or one that's split between peace and war. This peace and war divide again is shown here and in the background you got Pendleton on a, a single uh, stilt. Here you have Lincoln being pulled by a white horse representing, you know, fighting the war, whereas the Democrats are being pulled by a two-headed horse, war and peace. Voters are given a very clear choice through this sort of uh, political advertising, in a sense. Again, peace and war dividing the Democrats. So what did the election campaign look like? Well, this is a, an image from 1864 that shows a, a political rally for McClellan in New York City. And you can see the signs. You've got mostly men, but there are some children and women as well. Um, you're going to have speakers who are out there. You can see on the right-hand side, uh, pamphlets are being thrown out for people to pick up. They would have fireworks. Here's another one. This is in New York City in September of 1864. And um, in the in you can see the statue of George Washington to his right. You can see a stage and it's illuminated by um, little lights that are hung around uh, above the stage. You can sp see a speaker standing there and then gathered around are people listening and people passing out um, pamphlets and talking. You can again see mostly men, but on the left you can see one woman. In the field, the, the politics were also discussed and soldiers were very interested in the election of 1864 because what they were fighting for was at stake. Now, at the beginning of the Civil War, Pennsylvania was the only state with a law on the books that permitted soldiers to vote. And in October of 1861, soldiers from Pennsylvania voted as far away as Virginia. But there was a tremendous amount of fraud in that election. In fact, there was one uh, regiment that had 900 votes for one candidate, even though in that regiment there were only 100 registered voters from uh, Philadelphia. And so there was just a lot of fraud. There were a number of contested elections. And in the aftermath of the election, the Pennsylvania State Supreme Court ruled that it was unconstitutional for soldiers to vote away from home. Well, in 1862, the Democrats made great gains in the state and uh, congressional elections around the North. And the Republicans came to conclude that the reason they lost in 1862 was because all their voters were fighting and the Democrats were left at home to vote. And so by the fall of 1864, 19 Northern states passed laws that enfranchised soldiers. And so for the first time in American history, you're gonna have a lot of men who are eligible to vote with absentee ballots. 15 of those states sent um, poll workers essentially to the fields to collect the ballots. But four of those states, Connecticut, New York, um, West Virginia, and Minnesota 
allowed soldiers to send their ballots home by mail, what we would today see as regular absentee voting or voting by mail. And so the soldiers are going to debate the issues at stake in the election. And here's another image. Uh, this is in the Shenandoah Valley in October or November of 64. Uh, that's supposed to be Sheridan voting, but I'm not sure it's a very good likeness of him. And so again, here, this is the image I used for the front cover of the book. Men are gathered around uh, to discuss politics and to vote. And so they would set up polls in the field using whatever they had. So here they've set up a polling place on a, a barrel. Sometimes they would set up tables like these Pennsylvania soldiers have done and cover it with a flag and um, go vote that way. Now, there was actually um, a fair bit of fraud among the New York votes in the election of 1864. Governor Seymour sent state agents down to collect the ballots from the soldiers and the state agents who were in Baltimore were found to be stuffing ballots, essentially. They were making big boxes full of ballots. They were, they were just inventing names of soldiers and signing the affidavits and then sending them home. And it's estimated they may have sent home several thousand uh, fraudulent Democratic ballots. And so this is a political cartoon that shows what was happening with some of these mail-in ballots that the Democrats were collecting. And in fact, those two guys in Baltimore were arrested and tried before a military commission for this offense. And they tried to make the case that they should be tried in a civil court, but the Lincoln administration tried them in a military court anyway. And in that trial, the judge advocate who was prosecuting the case actually called for these two defendants to be executed for what they had done. They ended up being sentenced to a very long imprisonment. It may have been life in prison. Ultimately, they were let out of prison a few years later. Three men were arrested in, in Washington, D.C. for doing the same thing. They were able to get better lawyers and they were actually able to be, to be acquitted, although Edwin Stanton, the Secretary of War, was convinced that they were guilty. Now, I want to show you some images of elections up in the north on the home front. And uh, this is, these are, I think all of them are from New York City, everything I'm going to show you. Again, I mentioned that when you voted in that era, you would go to a polling place and pick up a ballot from your political party. And so here you can see uh, you've got a couple stands set up. On the left, it says Union. If you're a Lincoln voter, you're going to go there. On the right, it's the friends of, it looks like it says the Democrats meet here. That's where you go to get your ballots. They brought invalid soldiers to the polls in the same way that people today try to get, you know, voters to the polls. They would send carriages to get wounded veterans out to vote. There was voter fraud at home here, and this is an image called the frequent voter. And this guy went to vote early and often, and he got caught, and so he's being hauled off to prison. As we've seen in elections in our day, there were long lines in uh, polling places. And I want to point out here, if you look at this, the uh, lamppost, you'll see a black man standing there. Black men in New York could vote in 1864 if they owned a significant amount of property. Black men could vote in as many as five or six northern states at the beginning of the Civil War. This is an image from a British newspaper. I actually have it hanging on my wall right behind me. Most of these are hanging on my wall, I should add. Um, this is an image of a British newspaper, and it shows people in London wanted to know what it looked like to vote in America. And this shows the wealthy part of New York City where the, the elites are voting. And then we get the, um, the poor parts of New York City. And so this is from uh, a poorer part of New York, and it shows the voting inside of what looks to be a grog shop. You've got all these barrels. And if you look right in the middle of the image, you'll see the ballot boxes and you can see that they are glass bowls. And then on the British image, this is what it shows on the bottom half of the image. And so again, you see the, the two stands where the, the Republicans and the Democrats go to pick up their voting. But here you've got a lot of violence, you've got fighting, you've got poverty, you've got animals running around. And so people in London would see, okay, we now know what it looks like to vote in uh, a wealthy part. And then this is actually the very famous Five Points slums in New York. This is, uh, these are my favorite images from the election of 1864. You might be able to see them over my shoulder there as well. Um, 
This appeared shortly after the November election. On the left-hand side, you have a drunk voter being, being led to the polls. And in the caption, it says, by the Philistines. And on the right-hand side, you have a veteran of the War of 1812 marching arm in arm with a veteran of the Civil War. And this gave a powerful message about the difference that this newspaper saw between the Republicans and the Democrats. The Democrats are corrupt. They're getting people drunk. They're, that's how they're getting them to vote. And if you look in the, the two election official, uh, you know, electioneering people's hands, you see these papers. Those are probably ballots that they're carrying. And in the 19th century, there was a kind of ballot that some um, unethical politicians used where they were basically tissue paper and there were lots of ballots stuck together. And what the voter would do is shove it real hard into the ballot box. And when it got shoved in, it would break into pieces so that there were, you know, instead of just one vote, you were casting many votes. And I always like to think that um, maybe those are the kind of ballots that these Philistines are carrying there. Juxtapose that with these two men on the right, one of whom sacrificed his body and risked his life to save the nation from Britain in 1812, the other who has done the same to um, save the nation in 1864. There is a very clear message um, for who you should vote for in 1864. And um, to try to enforce Republican voting, one of the things and th that a lot of Republicans did, especially in border regions, was they required voters to take loyalty oaths in order to, um, in order to keep Democrats from voting or to keep pro-slavery voters from voting. Most of this was in the border states, places like Maryland, Kentucky, Missouri, but it did happen in places in the North. And the, you know, some of these oaths were put in place by state legislatures, some of them by executive officers, some of them by military officers who were taking control of, um, of certain districts and actually running the elections with bayonets. And my favorite oath from the election of 1864 was actually instituted by Andrew Johnson of Tennessee. Remember, he's the military governor of Tennessee in 1864. He's also the Republican candidate for vice president. And he's running against the Democrats who have called in their platform for an armistice to negotiate peace with the Confederates. And Andrew Johnson, using his authority as military governor of Tennessee, required that voters would swear to support and defend the Constitution and the nation, and then swear this, and this is a quote, that I will cordially oppose all armistices or negotiations for peace with rebels in arms. So what is Andrew Johnson, the Republican candidate or Union Party candidate for vice president doing? He's saying in my state, you cannot vote Democrat because the Democrats have said that they want a negotiation for peace and an armistice. Well, you have to swear not to support something like that. Um, those were the kind of things that did happen in some of the election districts, or in, in that case, in all of Tennessee during the election of 1864. There also was some violence in the election. And again, most of this happened in the border states. They stationed gunboats off Manhattan to make sure that violence wouldn't break out in the way that it had a year, year and a half earlier with the New York City draft riots. No violence did break out in New York City that day. But violent, there was, uh, there were people arrested in Kentucky and Missouri and uh, and Maryland, including in some cases uh, generals, and also uh, in one case a state judge from the state supreme court of of Kentucky who was up for re-election. So as peaceful as the election was in some places, there were some seemly, uh, less seemly sides in others. At the end of the day. Crowds would gather around to get the returns. Today we can, you know, go log in online or watch cable news and we see the returns come in pretty quickly. In those days, you would go down to the newspaper office and the telegraph would send in the returns. And so this is a crowd outside of New York City um, watching the returns come in. And they're outside of the New York Herald office. In the end, Abraham Lincoln won 
a vast, uh, a massive majority. And so this is a cartoon of Lincoln being carried in uh, on the shoulders of a quote, large majority. And so you would have long Abraham Lincoln for a little longer. Now I wanna, I'll, I'll take off my sharing screen, but I'll talk for a couple more minutes just about the outcome of the election. And I'll, I'll stop sharing the screen so that um, you're not just looking at a slide there. Um, Lincoln won a solid majority of the popular vote. He won about 2.2 million votes to McClellan's 1.8 million votes in the election, you know, rough estimate. And ultimately Lincoln carried 55% of the popular vote to McClellan's 45% of the popular vote. And in the electoral college, Lincoln won by a landslide. I think it was 212 to 21. And so um, the election was a clear mandate that Lincoln then used to push for uh, ratific passage and then ratification of the 13th amendment. For 150 years, people looked at the soldier vote as um, just as clear in what it meant. 78% of the people of the soldiers who voted, voted for Lincoln. And about 156,000 soldiers voted in the field. And then, you know, from four states, they voted at home as well. And, uh, you know, 78% of the soldiers voted for Lincoln. And so most scholars and historians of the 20th century and into the 21st century have said, well, very clearly the soldiers came to support Lincoln and they came to support emancipation. And uh, they showed that by casting such overwhelming majorities for the incumbent. And um, what I tried to do in this book was show how that might not actually be the case. And so what I did, was I, I looked at court martial records and I looked at um, a lot of letters that soldiers were writing and I looked at uh, records related to desertion and uh, dismissal from the service for officers who had been seen as um, going against uh, Lincoln or the war effort. And what I found in my research was that there was a, actually a tremendous amount of intimidation against Democrats who remained in the army in 1864. And so I suggest in the book that a lot of Democrats chose not to re-enlist in 1864 and they left the army. And so the composition of the army changed by the time you get to the election of 1864. And then I also show how um, many soldiers were punished publicly for saying bad things about Lincoln or emancipation. They would be made to wear placards in camp that said they had criticized Lincoln or emancipation. Um, I found one guy who said, old Abe Lincoln is a goddamned old shit. And he got punished publicly for that. I always thought if I had called this book, old Abe Lincoln is a goddamned old shit, I would have sold a lot more copies than I did, but I'm not a marketing person. So I didn't think of it in time. Um, but you know, soldiers like that are gonna be punished in public ways. And then their fellow soldiers who might share their sentiments are gonna realize that they should keep their sentiments to themselves. I found a lot of soldiers who didn't want to voice their political opinions publicly because they were afraid of what could happen. And then the other thing that I'll say about this is I found a lot of soldiers who wanted to vote for McClellan because they were Democrats but they couldn't vote for the Democratic Party for two reasons. One is they the Democrats had called the war a failure and these are guys who are fighting for the union and they're not going to vote for a party that calls them a failure. And the second reason is the Democrats had nominated a peace Democrat. And these soldiers who were Democrats in the field, they, they actually write about this, that they're afraid what happens if George McClellan dies, then a copperhead becomes president. And um, so for, for all these reasons, and I'm just very briefly summarizing the book, but for all these reasons, I, I believe there were a number of Democratic soldiers who either voted for Lincoln as a one-time act, they're gonna vote Republican, or they chose not to vote. And you know, 156,000 soldiers voted out of how many were in the field. I think there were a lot of soldiers who chose to exercise their franchise by not voting in 1864 because they didn't wanna vote for Lincoln because they saw him as an abolitionist, but they didn't wanna vote for McClellan because they saw his party as uh, treasonous. The last thing I'll say, and then I'll, I'll uh, turn it back over to Mike and I'll be happy to take questions, is that 
I think the most important thing we can take away from the election of 1864 is the very fact that it happened itself. This was the first time that an election happened in the midst of civil war. And not everyone, uh, you know, there were a lot of Democrats who believed that Lincoln might either not choose to try to cancel the election or not abide by its results. But you can see in the blind memorandum and the meeting with Frederick Douglass that Lincoln was committed to abiding by the results of the election. And um, in the aftermath of the election, Lincoln pointed out that he was waging the war to make sure that democracy survived. And, um, and I think the testament of the election of 1864 is that even in the midst of the greatest crisis of our history, uh, American democracy did survive. And it wasn't always pretty, uh, but it did survive. So with that, thank you so much. And uh, Mike, if you want to come back in and tell, I, I haven't had the chat open, so I don't know what the questions are. Oh, I'm, uh, I just opened it up. And democracy was preserved. So uh, uh, Michael Schaefer says, please send me Jonathan's email address when you get a chance. I've got a chance, but I can't do it right now. And I'll, I'll, I'll throw out just for everyone. I have a website called jonathanwhite.org. So it's J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N and then white like the color.org. And um, my contact info is there and I've got a lot of information about my books and articles and I've got C-SPAN lectures there. Um, but one of the things I've done that I think will be of interest to many of you is I've gone online and I've found as I, I haven't updated it for a little while, but I found as many um, freely available primary sources from the Civil War as I could find. And I've put them all up and they're all in different categories. So you can look for soldiers, letters and diaries, newspapers, civilians papers, resources put up by state archives or state um, historical societies. I have uh, probably about a hundred regimental histories that are available online that I've linked to. So as you're doing research, if you go to jonathanwhite.org, you can hopefully find materials that would be of use to you. Beautiful. Jerry uh, says, I understand that in his first election, Lincoln didn't think it right to vote for himself, so he cut off the top part of the ballot and turned in the lower part. Yeah, that, that's right. And that's also something that was very common in the 19th century. It was known as scratching. And so when you got the ballot, it would say, you know, for president, for vice president, for governor, for dog catcher, for all the different offices. And if you didn't like one of the candidates, you would scratch out their name and cross it out or and maybe write in another person's name. And so in 1860, um, the day before the election, someone said to Lincoln, well, how are you going to vote tomorrow? <laughs> and, you know, Lincoln didn't want to say, I'm going to vote for myself. And in fact, I think that's right that he didn't vote for himself. So Lincoln just responded by ballot. And, you know, L Lincoln had a very quick, he was very quick witted. And so rather than answer, uh, what the person wanted to hear. He just said, I'm gonna vote by ballot. He voted present. <laughs> uh, Frank says, am I correct in 1864, the presidential candidate did not choose his vice presidential candidate? It's a great question. Um, in 1860, Lincoln did not choose Hannibal Hamlin. Lincoln was uh, he had his wire pullers who were at the convention um, trying to make things happen. And in 1864, George McClellan did not pick George Pendleton. That was, you know, the convention trying to negotiate. It's a little bit trickier with Lincoln. And um, part of the reason it, it's trickier to know is that in the 1890s, there was actually a pretty big war between Alexander McClure, who was a very prominent Pennsylvania politician, and John G. Nicolay, um, Lincoln's private secretary. And on McClure's side was Ward Hill Lamon, who is a highly unreliable person. Lamon and Lincoln have been friends for decades, going back to the Illinois circuit in the 1840s or 50s. And um, Lamon wrote memoir. He had one memoir written in 1871 that he paid a Democrat to write, and it was scandalous and full of um, inaccuracies. Uh, 
And then he, his daughter published a memoir after Lamon died, I think around 1893 or 95, that's full of inaccuracies that I write about at length when I write about Lincoln's dreams in my book, Midnight in America. But Lamon and um, McClure were telling uh, one story in terms of um, how Hannibal Hamlin got dumped and how it was that, um, that Andrew Johnson got picked. And then John G. Nicolay responded, with a different story. And McClure and Lamon, they were suggesting that um, that Lincoln may have wanted Butler, Ben Butler to be the nominee. And um, it, it's hard to know for sure, but I, I do think that Lincoln was working to some extent behind the scenes to get, uh, to get um, Johnson selected, but Lincoln wasn't there. He wasn't at the convention. So he had to leave it to his surrogates to try to make it happen. Jerry says the Lincoln Museum in Springfield has a whole hallway of negative caricatures. True. And Michael uh, says, was it likely Lincoln would have lost the election if Sherman had failed in his march to the sea? Um. I, I think I think the pivotal moment is is the fall of Atlanta rather than the march to the sea. It, am I misunderstanding the question? No. So I, I think the pivotal moment for Lincoln is the march to the sea, or sorry, is the fall of Atlanta. And that once Atlanta falls um, and then uh, Mobile Bay falls, and Sheridan is going through the Shenandoah Valley. Those, those three things I think are what combine to make Lincoln's reelection secure. And it's pretty clear by the second week of October that Lincoln's gonna be reelected. And the reason is that the um, Maine held elections at the end of September, they went Republican. And then Indiana, Ohio, and Pennsylvania held elections on the first Tuesday after the first Monday of November. So I think it was October 12th and they went Republican. And Maryland held a referendum to uh, end slavery in Maryland on October 12th and 13th. And Lincoln had been very public in his support of that new state constitution. And so you've got elections in what, five states between the end of September and early October. Once those all go Republican, everyone knows Lincoln's gonna win in November. There's no doubt. Right. Bill Miller says, are you aware of other instances where a vice presidential candidate was replaced prior to a second term election? Well, FDR, uh, although it wasn't his second term, I don't know how many times FDR replaced his vice president, but putting Harry Truman in in, 90, in 1944 is one instance. Um, Andrew Jackson is another because uh, wasn't John Calhoun his first and then Calhoun resigned and went to the Senate. Um, so yeah, it, it certainly happened. Those are two that come to mind. I'm sure there's others. So Michael Slinger says, um, did all states allow soldiers to vote in the field? No, so only 19 states pass laws to allow soldiers to, to vote. And it's not clear that soldiers from all 19 states voted. So you know, Nevada becomes a state on Halloween in 1864. You know, they got Nevada in just in time to get those electoral votes. And the Nevada Constitution allowed for soldiers to vote. But I've never found any evidence that Nevada soldiers voted. Um, some of the soldiers votes were not sent back in time to count. So if you look at the results of the soldier vote from Michigan, for example, it's a pretty small turnout because it took a long time for the votes to get back and they just didn't make it back in time. And then um, democratic states did not allow soldiers to vote. So New Jersey and Illinois um, did not allow soldiers to vote. Uh, Massachusetts, I've never been able to quite figure out this one. Massachusetts did not allow soldiers to vote even though they were very overwhelmingly Republican. Maybe they just figured they didn't need the soldiers votes. Um, Delaware didn't allow soldiers to vote. And so what Stanton did for those states like Indiana was they furloughed soldiers to go home. One of the things I write about in, in the book is 
there were regiments where the the officer, the commanding officer, the colonel, or or the captains and at the cap at the company level would call the men forward and say, everyone who intends to vote for Lincoln, take a step forward. And those were the men who were selected to go home to vote. And so I, I write about one guy in this book who deserted a number of times. And this sort of thing happened in his unit. He was from Vermont. And um, he wrote home to his, I think his brother or his mother, and he said, I'll be as I'll be as dark, I'll be as dark as the N-word, I think he, he used, or he might have said darky, um, in order to be able to go home. In other words, he stepped forward telling his officers, yeah, I'll vote Republican, because that was how he could get out of the army. Um, again, there's no secrecy in the voting in that era, and that's really key to understanding the politics. Kim Brace asked, did Southern states have similar provisions or practices for absentee voting by Confederate soldiers? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, sort of. So in 1861, a number of Confederate states had soldiers vote. Um, and I'm, I'm blanking on even what the election was for. But I know that in 1861, some Confederate soldiers did vote, but it, it wasn't an issue during the war um, in large part because the Confederate Constitution made Jefferson Davis president for six years and he was ineligible for reelection. So there was no presidential election in 1864 in the Confederacy. You know, I, I was actually asked this question about a week ago by someone who's, who's trying to write about elections in the Confederacy. Um, because no one has really dug into in a systematic way what the elect, you know, what did the gubernatorial election of 1863 look like in North Carolina? There's not been a lot of work on that. Um, and uh, as far as I know, after 1861, I, I don't know of Confederate soldiers voting, but I have to confess, my research has been almost exclusively on, on, the, um, on the North. What I will say to Kim and Kim, good to hear from you. I know we've met at the Lincoln Forum. Um, uh, the book that was published in 1915 by a veteran, uh, his name was Josiah Benton, and the book is called Voting in the Field. And the first chapter in his book is about the soldiers of the Confederacy voting in 1861. And honestly, I haven't read it since 2000, and I just can't think back 21 years to what he says. But you can find that book on archive.org or on Google Books, and uh, that'll tell you everything that I could possibly tell you if I had read it more recently. Kim also asked, were people aware on the election night, who won, or did it take several days for enough votes to come in to be able to declare who had won? Um, it was pretty clear by late in the night, but at one point in the evening, probably around 10 p.m., I would guess, um, a group of serenaders came to the White House and they called upon Lincoln and they wanted him to say something to them. And he went out on the White House balcony and said, you know, he, this is paraphrasing, but he said basically, well, we don't know the outcome yet, but it looks good and we'll know soon. So, um, you know, with, with the election of 1860, I think Lincoln knew by about one in the morning that he had won. Um, I don't know the exact time for 64, but it, I would guess it was probably around midnight, maybe a little bit later. Another Lincoln Forum guy, uh, Dr. John Willen uh, yep. says, good to see you, Professor White. Could you comment on Secretary Stanton's attempt to suppress the Democratic vote in the army? Yeah, this is something that I I looked a lot at in um, in doing the research for this book. Stanton, I think, um, you know, he did a lot of dismissals of Democratic officers. So at one point in the book, I, um, I catalog a whole host of officers who were dismissed right before the election of 1864. Um, the War Department suppressed Repu uh, Democratic newspapers from getting to the troops. So Republican newspapers are uh, freely flowing among the potential voters in the armies of the Union, whereas Democratic papers are not. It was very difficult in some cases to get Democratic ballots to the field. 
because Stanton was willing to work with Republicans, but not as much with Democrats. And so you find Democrats who are serving in, in the army, who are writing home, trying to get ballots sent to them, saying it's impossible to get Democratic ballots in the field. Um, and then uh, there were officers who were court-martialed, uh, as I mentioned before, who for expressing disaffection with Lincoln or for publishing up, you know, letters to the editor of newspapers um, for all sorts of things that today we would consider political speech. Now, I will say the fifth article of war at the time forbid criticism of the president. So on the one hand, you've got these citizen soldiers who view themselves as ordinary Americans who have not shed their First Amendment rights. They have not yet internalized the concept of um, not being able to criticize the president. So they think they should be able to, to go, say whatever they want about Lincoln. Um, but that violates the Articles of War. And so Stanton and the War Department and the Union High Command uh, often punished men who uh, did things like that. Gary asks, were the anti-armistice oaths in Tennessee the primary basis on which the state's electorate votes uh, were invalidated? Also, why were Louisiana's votes invalidated? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, for the first one, I don't, I don't know that that's why the Tennessee vote was invalidated. And I don't know the answer for sure, but I'm going to speculate here. Um, because Tennessee, Arkansas, and Louisiana all had elections. They all, um, they all voted. The, the Louisiana election was actually a bit controversial because it was run by the military and the military enfranchised white soldiers to vote. And the black community of Louisiana wrote to General Shepley and uh, General Banks and tried to get them to give them the right to vote as well. And Shepley and Banks would not. Um, I may be wrong, but my hunch is that um, Congress didn't want to recognize Lincoln's Reconstruction governments yet in those states. And if they counted the electoral votes from Louisiana, Arkansas, and Tennessee, that Congress would have been implicitly recognizing that Lincoln had control over the Reconstruction of Southern states. And they didn't maybe want to, well, they certainly didn't want to do that yet. That was going to be a big fight. In, it was a big fight in 64. It was going to continue to be a fight in 65. And then, of course, it was a huge fight between Congress and Andrew Johnson uh, after Lincoln's death. So my, my hunch is that it was Congress, Republicans in Congress, didn't want to count the votes. They didn't need them for Lincoln to win, and they didn't want to recognize Lincoln as being the guy in charge of Reconstruction. Again, I may be wrong, but that's my guess. <laughs> All right. T. Williams says, if we were using pre-printed ballots, how did they uh, how did they do ver any verification of one person, one vote during these elections? Yeah, so you were supposed to, part of the reason I mentioned earlier, part of the reason uh, that the state Supreme Court of Pennsylvania struck down the election uh, or the voting law in 1861 was that, um, the state constitution required you to vote in person. And the idea was your neighbors know who you are and they can say, yes, he's a qualified voter or no, he's not a qualified voter. Um, and that was the only verification. This is an era before voter registration. Now voter registration is gonna begin to become a thing by 1865 in some places, but there's not a lot of, uh, you know, that doesn't really exist prior to the civil war. It's really neighbors um, its neighbors uh, being able to tell who should be there and who shouldn't be there. There's a, there's a terrible movie called The Copperhead. I apologize if any of you like it. I, I just, I, it was a horrible movie. It's, um, it's done by the same guy who did Gettysburg and Gods and Generals. Um, maybe part of why I didn't like the movie was when I saw it in the theater, the air conditioning stopped working. And so it was <laughs> hot as Hades and that made me miserable too. But it's a movie about upstate New York and the divisions between the Republicans and the Democrats um, in this one community. And the abolitionists are the villains and the copperheads are the heroes. 
And as horrible as I think the movie is, there's one scene that's wonderful. And it's November of 1862. It's when Governor C or Horatio Seymour is running for governor. And it shows the Copperhead showing up to the, the polling place. And the abolitionists are there. And the, the Irish immigrant tries to vote. And they try to stop him. And I actually use that as a clip in class to give students sort of a flavor of what elections look like, where neighbors are there. And it can get violent when one guy says, hey, I'm qualified to vote. And other people say, no, you're not. Um, and let me say one other thing about the ballots. Um, the ballots, again, were printed by the parties, but in the field, they didn't always have ballots. And so I've looked at a number, hundreds of ballots are held at the state archives in Pennsylvania, and they didn't have printed ballots in all the camps. So what they did was they just, they took letterhead from, you know, military documents and snipped it into pieces and they wrote for Lincoln or for McClellan on it and those were the ballots they used. The other thing you could do back then that was very would be it would seem outrageous to us today in the newspapers on the second page you know all the newspapers were partisan they were either a Republican paper or a Democratic paper and they would print the entire party ticket on the second page of the newspaper and so you could go and cut out that part of the newspaper and then actually vote with that. And so again, you could cross out names you didn't like, but you would vote with a piece of the newspaper. So uh, the voting culture was just so different from how it is today. I guess. C.S. Bjork uh, says, what parallels do you see between the 18, uh, I suppose this is 1864 election and the 2020 election? Can we learn from history? Uh. I'm going to avoid the first part of that question about parallels, um, other than to say all elections are controversial, right? Um, and uh, uh, I had another thought that now has just escaped my mind. Um, you know, my uh, Ben Franklin when he walked out of the Constitutional Convention was approached by a woman who said, uh, what kind of government have you given us, Dr. Franklin? And Franklin's very famous reply was a republic if you can keep it. And so I think if there's any, lecture, any lesson for American politics, it's that uh, voters need to be informed, voters need to be engaged, um, voters need to be they need to participate. Now, sometimes that means you participate by not voting. Um, as, I, as I suggest happened in 1864, I think a lot of soldiers participated, exercised their franchise by not voting. Um, so, but you know, does history repeat itself? My hope is that the American Republic can survive. Um, and I think it will, at least for some time, although we're naive to think if we think that it'll go on forever. But my hope is that, you know, one of the reasons I'm a college professor is because I want to educate young students on American history. I want them to understand the American Constitution and rule of law. I want them to understand how the system's supposed to work. George Mason, when he wrote the Virginia Declaration of Rights in 1776, talked about that Americans or Virginians need a frequent recurrence to fundamental principles um, they need moderation, they need uh, frugality, they need temperance, they need all these sort of civic virtues. And so, um, you know, I don't know if history repeats itself, but I, my goal as an educator is to get people to understand history uh, so that they have an appreciation for the system we have so that we can have a system that survives. As Ben Franklin said, we, we need to be citizens who can make it survive. So that, that wasn't gonna answer the question, but I, I wasn't going to go quite there anyway. So hopefully that suffices. Richard asks, were the soldiers' votes crucial in any states? Great question. The soldiers' votes carried the referendum in Maryland. So without the soldiers' votes, slavery would have persisted in Maryland until ratification of the 13th Amendment uh, 12, 13 months later. The really interesting thing about the Maryland soldier vote is that soldiers were not allowed to vote in Maryland. And so in April of 1864, they call a state constitutional convention and they write this constitution. And in the, con the new constitution that's going to be voted on, soldiers are given the right to vote. 
And the unionist governor of Maryland decided, well, we're going to let soldiers vote on the constitution that would enfranchise them. And so soldiers then vote in an election that they're not authorized to vote in and their votes are the votes that carry the election. And so pro-slavery Democrats actually sue and take it into the state Supreme Court and the highest court, it's called the Court of Appeals in Maryland, upholds the referendum and upholds emancipation, even though, eh, I don't know if they technically should have been allowed to vote since they weren't authorized before ratification. The soldier vote um, probably carried the elections of New York and Connecticut although we can never know for sure because those states had their ballots mailed home. Um, but they were so close that if soldiers voted at the same rate, 80% roughly that soldiers in the field voted, then yes, those states were probably carried by, um, by the soldiers. And then um, I think there's one other one, but it's escaping me right now. Wow. Uh, Robert Flood says, could Lincoln have won without the absentee soldier vote? Yeah, Lincoln, Lincoln would have won without the soldier vote. It, if he had, you know, there's a good chance he would have lost New York and Connecticut if the soldiers had not voted. Um, but, you know, the, the soldiers are 156,000, the soldiers votes in the field are 156,000 votes and Lincoln wins roughly 2.2 million to 1.8 million. So he had he had a margin and I think it would have been distributed across the states in a way that um, he, he would have he would have won without the soldier vote. But Lincoln was one of the one of the people in 1862. He wrote a letter to Carl Schurz on November 10th, 1862 saying the reason we lost is our friends are in the field while Democrats are home voting. Um, so he he understood the importance of getting soldiers to vote as a precaution for uh, carrying the election. He also was very supportive of, you know, getting Nevada to become a state, get those three extra electoral votes just in case. <laughs> Jerry says, super job, Jonathan. I sure learned much. Could I ask where you are a professor? Yes, I teach at Christopher Newport University, which is in the Tidewater part of Virginia. I'm in Newport News. Um, I live half a mile from the turret of the monitor, and I actually wrote a book about the monitor a couple of years ago, having gotten inspired by being here. But it's a CNU is a great school. Um, we've got about 5,000 students, most of whom are either from somewhere between Richmond and Northern Virginia. Uh, we've, we've been at a school for about 55 years or so. We started as a feeder school to William and Mary as a two-year institution and now are a, a, four, a full a four-year school. But if any of you have kids or grandkids that are looking for a, a place to go to college, the American Studies program at CNU is, is where I teach and it's a, it's a great, great place to be. Ken Newton says, did the Confederacy make any attempts to vote in the, in the Southern states to defeat Lincoln? Yeah, they, um, they did not do that, although I'll tell one story. Um, they tried to influence the election in a number of different ways. So there were Confederate agents in uh, Canada who were trying to institute raids into the North to free POWs and to light buildings on fire in New York and then later in St. Albans, Vermont. So they're trying to influence the election. They wanna fight as much as they can to demoralize the Northern electorate, um, but they don't, they don't vote in the election with, uh, there's one exception that, that I know of um, where, where they did. There were a group of Confederates from Maryland who captured some Maryland soldiers and Union soldiers. So, you know, Maryland sends gray and blue. And so the soldiers take off their gray uniforms and they put on the blue uniforms of the men they had captured and they took their ballots and they went in and voted for Lincoln. Um, and uh, one of them wrote about this after the fact and said, for no one would question us if we voted for Lincoln. And so, you know, there's this other instance where, you know, you're voting for Lincoln, that vote's gonna be counted. And so here's a Confederate voting for Lincoln, not because he liked Lincoln, but because he wanted to make a point.
<laughs> My. Michael Shaver says, great book and a wonderful presentation. Thanks, Jonathan, Mike, and the Civil War Roundtable Congress. Um, Michael also included a uh, photograph of himself with your book. Awesome. Everyone should do that. Absolutely. Let's, let's see more of those. Uh, Jerry says, Lincoln also suggested that General Rosecrans be the VP. Yeah, I hadn't read that. I haven't come across that. It, it may be. I, I just haven't heard that. That would yeah. have actually been controversial because Rose, Rosecrans was Roman Catholic. Yeah. And um, I don't know how the electorate would have gone for that. So that, that surprises me a little bit. Ed Lowe says, a wonderful presentation and thank you for the information on your website. All the best in your future projects. Thanks. Vicki says, when ballots were dropped in the ballot box, were they signed by the voter? No, they, they weren't signed. So um, I suppose there's, I mean, there's still no secrecy in the voting, but no, you, you wouldn't have signed it. Doug Krasik says, uh, what, do, <laughs> what do you think was the rationale for Kentucky to vote for McClellan? Well, you know, Kentuckians stay in the Union. Um, they try to be neutral in 1861, and then they ultimately uh, remain loyal to the Union. And for a lot of Kentuckians, they took Lincoln at his word in 1861, where he says, I'm not going to free the slaves. Now, I think Lincoln had good constitutional reasons for doing the Emancipation Proclamation, but they, the Kentuckians become really alarmed by that. Now, the Emancipation Proclamation did not free the slaves in Kentucky, but it does authorize the arming of black men into the Union Army. And um, recruiters then go into Kentucky and start recruiting black soldiers. And they're saying to slaves, you know, join the army and get free. And so loyal Union pro-slavery, slave-owning Kentuckians are livid about this. They feel like they've been hoodwinked and deceived and they're very upset. And so Kentucky soldiers are actually the only body of soldiers who vote against Lincoln. Lincoln wins every other state if you look at the soldiers of that state, but Kentucky soldiers go for McClellan and Kentucky as a whole goes for McClellan. Um, and I think a lot, of, I think it has entirely to do with emancipation and the arming of black soldiers. Yeah, it makes sense. T. Williams asked, did guys in the field vote for other offices or just for president? Yeah, they voted um, for whatever was up on the ballot. Now in November, it was mostly president, although Michigan had a congressional election um, that day, few states had other elections that day. Um, but the soldiers did vote absentee in September and October of 64, September from Maine, and then October again, you've got Maryland, Indiana, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. Um, and so yes, soldiers were voting absentee there. And I write about that at, at some length in the book as well. Um, but I won't tell you what I say, because you should get the book and then you can <laughs> see. Yeah, be like Michael. Uh, Roger Gelly says, great presentation. Jerry Payne says, thank you, Mike. Uh, uh, another great program. Uh, Robert Carlson says, fascinating expl explanation of the election. Thank you much. And T. Williams says, so who printed the ballots for other offices? The parties did. And so, you know, it could be the parties would often work. Uh, all, again, all the newspapers in that era are partisan. They're all um, owned by party operatives. And so one of the things was, you know, you wanted to get control of the state legislature because then you would throw your bus the business of the state to your party. Um, and so the parties are going to, those printers are going to be doing the printing of the state election ballots or the presidential ballots. All right. So uh, other questions. May take a few moments to get those fingers moving. Mike, um, my ch chat is not working, um, but I have a question about uh, the voting in West Virginia. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, 
Um, Jonathan, can you, uh, were the citizens in West Virginia involved in the voting in 1864? Yeah, West Virginia became a state in 1863 and um, they were able to vote. And West Virginia was one of the four states that had uh, voting by mail. So the, the soldiers would send their ballots home to be counted. All right. Thank you. Sure. Good to hear from you, Bill. So uh, uh, Kim, Kim Brace says that's, that's fine for printing ballots for people in the states, but how did the soldiers get the right ballot for local offices for oh, I see. their state? I, get, I see the question now. Um, every state was different. So in Pennsylvania, the governor appointed um, what were called election commiss commissioners. And those election commissioners would go to this, go to the South and find Pennsylvania soldiers and distribute the ballots to them and make sure that they got the right ballots. And in fact, um, in, in Pennsylvania, soldiers had to pay a, a small tax. And so the election commissioners would also try to handle that matter as well. And so they they traveled down in October of 64 with the uh, state congressional ballots, and then they do it again in November with the presidential ballots. New York did it differently. New York, Governor Seymour used state agents. State agents are a different thing. Every Northern state had state agents. These are men who travel to the seat of war to try to take care of things that men from their state need, soldiers from their state need. And so Seymour essentially authorized them to do, um, to do the electioneering. Seymour talked to Chauncey Depew, who was a Republican and who was the Secretary of State of New York about trying to work with him to send Republicans as well, but Depew didn't work with Seymour. And so the state agents for New York really just kept, uh, you know, they, they only worried about Democratic votes. And again, they were forging a lot of them. Um, and then the Republicans went and tried to collect their own ballots. And so they're gonna, send people down who are going to try to find um, men and get the right ballots to them. Now in New York, uh, yeah, Governor Seymour was up for re-election in November. So they would have, now that would have been a statewide um, office. I don't recall if there was a congressional election in New York in November or if it was at a different time. So if that was the case, they would have had to get the right ballots to people. And I, I honestly don't know fully how they would have done it, but it would have been those kind of people who were taking the ballots to the South. The One of the Pennsylvania election commissioners, um, his last name was McKibben. No, that's not who I want though. Uh, I forget his name, McKelvey, I think was his last name. His um, diary as an election commissioner was published in the Pennsylvania Magazine of History and Biography I think back in the 80s or 90s, it was edited by one of his descendants and then by the historian Daniel Crofts. And if you go to my website, jonathanwhite.org, and you click on the, the research tab and then the state tab, you'll see I list a bunch of state journals that are available for free. And so if you go to that and, and look for the Pennsylvania Magazine of History and Biography, um, you can download his journal. And he, again, I haven't read that since 2001, um, but he describes in great detail what it was like to go to the field and distribute the ballot. So it'll give you a really good sense of what that looked like. All right. Well, let, let's let that be the, uh, the last uh, remark. Thank you so very much, uh, Jonathan, for being with us tonight. Uh, I think everyone really learned a great deal and certainly enjoyed the, uh, the presentation. And thank you everyone for being with us here on Civil War Roundtable Congress.